So in the last video, we talked about glycolysis, where we take a glucose molecule, we go through all these chemical reactions, eventually forming pyruvate molecules. And we learned in the last video that a couple of these steps are irreversible. For example, when we take the original glucose and go through this first step, catalyzed by hexokinase forming this intermediate, this step is irreversible. When we go in this direction, we explained how we don't go in the reverse direction. We, we only go in this direction. Then we explained how these steps are reversible. They, both, they go in both directions. And then we also explained this step was irreversible, taking this compound and converting it into this compound. This was another irreversible step. Step. Then all these steps were reversible. They go in both directions. Then they go back, then forward again. These were uh, reversible. Then we explain this last step is irreversible. So this is glycolysis, taking glucose, going through these chemical reactions, forming pyruvate. However, we can also go in the reverse direction. We can take pyruvate and other carbon intermediates and go in the reverse direction, forming glucose molecules. But how? We explain how this step is irreversible. If taking this compound and converting it into this compound, if this step is irreversible, how do we go in the reverse direction and eventually forming glucose? Well, we bypass this step. Essentially what we do is we take this guy, we do another chemical reaction, and then we do another chemical reaction to form this guy. So we essentially bypass this step. And then again, the same thing with this step. We explain how this step was irreversible. However, we can bypass this step with another type of chemical reaction. And again, how, how do we make this favorable to go in this direction when we explained before that this was irreversible? Well, essentially what we do is we hydrolyze ATP molecules. Essentially in this step, we take an ATP and hydrolyze it to ATP. And in this step, we take an ATP and hydrolyze it to ATP. But the point is with these two steps, we're taking ATP molecules and hydrolyzing them into ADPs. And we know this is very thermodynamically favorable, going and taking ATP and hydrolyzing into ADP. So we use that favorability to pull forward these two reactions. And in the last video, we explained this in more detail, but we explained in the cell at all times has huge amounts of ATP, huge concentrations of ATP, and very small concentrations of ADP. And we explained in the cell, these concentrations of ATP and ADP are not equilibrium concentrations. We have way too much ATP and very little ADP. So therefore, when we take ATP and hydrolyze it into ADP, that's very favorable. When we take ATP and hydrolyze it to ADP, we're going towards equilibrium. So that's very thermodynamically favorable. Favorable. This, this ATP is very desperate to hydrolyze into ADP because it wants to go towards its equilibrium concentrations. So we explained the reaction quotient was very far away from the equilibrium concentrations, so they, therefore this had a very negative delta G and was very thermodynamically favorable and strongly went in this direction, which pushed this reaction that going in this particular direction forming this compound. And again, in the last video, we explained this in more detail, but the point is we used the hydrolysis of ATP into ADP to go in this particular direction. So again, so, and again, but something really important to realize is when you think about glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, this step is incredibly important. This particular chemical reaction, taking this guy and converting into this guy is very important for glycolysis. If we turn on this enzyme, then this step goes fast and we do glycolysis. However, if we turn on this enzyme, this step occurs fast and now we do gluconeogenesis. So that's how the cell regulates, because how does the cell know whether to do glycolysis or gluconeogenesis? And does the cell want to do glycolysis and gluconeogenesis at the same time? Well, no, that's a waste of energy. That makes no sense. So the cell either decides it either wants to do glycolysis or wants to do gluconeogenesis. How does it decide? Well, again, it's by activating these enzymes. For example, going in this direction, this particular step, taking this compound, converting into this compound, this is the rate limiting step. This step is very slow. So therefore, all these steps can occur fast, but if this step is slow, gluconeogenesis is slow. However, if we activate this enzyme, this, occur, this step occurs faster, and now gluconeogenesis occurs faster. But the point is, if we want to do glycolysis, we turn on this enzyme, and now we do glycolysis. If we want to do gluconeogenesis, we activate this enzyme, and now we do gluconeogenesis. But how do we regulate these enzymes? Well, it's hormones. If insulin is around, it activates this enzyme. Now this step goes fast, now we do glycolysis. So insulin leads to glycolysis. If glucagon is around, it activates this enzyme. So this step occurs fast, and now we do gluconeogenesis. So if glucagon is around, we do gluconeogenesis. And then again, Looking at this, let's imagine this is a cell. Again, if insulin is around and binds, it turns on this particular step. Now we do glycolysis. If glucagon is around, it binds to this, this receptor. It activates this particular enzyme. Now this step occurs fast. Now we're doing gluconeogenesis. The point is, it's, it's these hormones that regulate whether we do glycolysis going in this direction or whether we're doing gluconeogenesis going in this direction. 
So again, what do we need to do gluconeogenesis? Let's, let's say the cell wants to do gluconeogenesis, taking carbon intermediates like pyruvate and forming glucose. What do we need? Well, first of all, we need some kind of regulation. We need to turn on gluconeogenesis. And we know glucagon does that. It turns on this enzyme, now it turns on gluconeogenesis. So first, we need to regulate it and activate it. Next, we need a source of carbons. Because we know if we're going through gluconeogenesis, we're biosynthesizing glucose molecules. And glucose is a six carbon carbohydrate. So therefore, we need a source of carbons to funnel into gluconeogenesis to create glucose molecules. So we need a source of carbons. And also we need ATP. This is an anabolic process. It's biosynthesizing these glucose molecules require a lot of ATP. And we saw that in the step. We need a, we need a source of ATP to, to again, uh, to essentially fuel gluconeogenesis. So where do we get the carbons? Where do we get the carbons to, to siphon into gluconeogenesis? Well, one source are proteins or and peptides. We can hydrolyze those peptide bonds, creating amino acids. For example, specifically, let's say we had a peptide, we hydrolyzed the a peptide bond, creating the alanine amino acid. Well, we can do one quick reaction, deaminating it, instead of having this nitrogenous group, now we have a carbonyl group. But look, now we have pyruvate. We have pyruvate. So that's, that's interesting. That's the way we take a peptide, hydrolyze, get a particular amino acid of alanine, do a quick modification. Now we have pyruvate. Now we have a source of carbons. Those carbons from this this amino acid from this peptide, that's a source of carbons, which can be modified and, and go through chemical reactions to create intermediates of, glycol of gluconeogenesis, and now can go in the reverse direction, forming glucose molecules. So we take the carbons and peptides to form glucose molecules. And there are other sources of car uh, carbons. We can take lactate, do a quick modification, form pyruvate, now use those carbons and lactate to form pyruvate to form glucose molecules. Also remember those triacylglycerides in our adipocytes? We can hydrolyze these bonds, releasing glycerol do quick modifications forming this compound which can convert into glucose so that's how we can use these carbons and glycerol to form glucose molecules but the point is there are lots of different sources of carbons we can take peptides and create different amino acids to and convert them into some of these intermediates and use them to create glucose but again so again and something important to realize this gluconeogenesis where we're taking these car carbon sources and going in this direction, forming glucose molecules, and forming these glucose molecules, this gluconeogenesis, biosynthesizing these glucose molecules, mainly occurs mainly in the liver. It occurs a little bit in the kidneys, but mostly you should associate gluconeogenesis, the biosynthesizing these glucose molecules, with the liver. However, we know where we get our carbons to create these glucose molecules, but where do we get all the ATP? We know this requires a lot of ATP to go through gluconeogenesis. So where do we get the ATP? Well, again, remember our adipocytes with those triacylglycerides? We can hydrolyze those bonds, creating free fatty acids, acids. Now we can deliver those free fatty acids to the liver. Now those free fatty acids enter the mitochondria in the liver in our hepatocytes, and now they go through beta oxidation. When they go through beta oxidation, we create reduced cofactors. These reduced cofactors can fuel the electron transfer chain to create ATP. So now we've created the ATP, we need to fuel gluconeogenesis. So the point is, we, we burn fat, we take the energy in fat, we burn it, we create ATP, now we have the ATP we need to biosynthesize glucose molecules. And again, I have a video that goes into more detail on beta oxidation, I have a link of that video below. But again, the point is, we can take sort like uh, we can take these carbon sources, for example, proteins and these other carbon sources to biosynthesize glucose molecules, but we need energy and we get that energy from burning fat, burning fat to create ATP to go through gluconeogenesis. And the big picture idea of what's going on is we know we have our bloodstream and in our bloodstream we have glucose molecules and that's good because our brain requires glucose for it to function properly and it gets its glucose from the bloodstream. So that's good that we have glucose in the bloodstream to keep the brain happy. However, what happens if we don't eat for a couple of hours and our glycogen stores run out? Now we have low blood glucose concentrations and that's bad. That's bad for the brain. That's dangerous. Now the brain doesn't have a source of energy. So now we need to find a way to biosynthesize glucose molecules. Now we need to go through gluconeogenesis to biosynthesize glucose molecules to dump into the bloodstream to keep the brain happy. So how does this happen? Well, again, the blood glucose concentrations drop. So now the pancreas senses that those blood glucose concentrations drop. So in response, it releases glucagon. And now that glucagon tells the liver, 
hey, the blood glucose concentrations have dropped. Now we need to go through gluconeogenesis. And again, we explain how glucagon activates gluconeogenesis. Now we do gluconeogenesis, biosynthesizing glucose molecules to keep the brain happy, to dump into the bloodstream to keep the brain happy. But something else important is glucagon also activates lipolysis, where we break this, releasing those free fatty acids. Then those free fatty acids enter. And glucagon also activates beta oxidation to, to create ATP. So it's this glucagon that orchestrates all these chemical reactions to essentially have gluconeogenesis occur to restore blood glucose concentrations to keep the brain happy.